Let's go. Let's go. Oh, oh. did you want to? Sorry. sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next time. I'm in love with you. Snap out of it. I'll have what she's having. Too many guys think I'm a concept, or I complete them, or I'm gonna make them alive. But I'm just a fucked up girl who's looking for my own peace of mind. Don't assign me yours. Caustic wit is my religion. I would make a great queen because I am so stubborn. I say when it comes to stardom and Lauren, there are no accidents. Hi, Karen Peterson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Citizen Dame, the podcast where we talk about pretty much everything that we want to talk about, and no one can tell us not to. Uh, I am Lauren Humphreys Brooks. With me, as always, is Karen Peterson. Hello, Karen. Hello. And how are things with you on this on this fine? What are we in August? We're still in August. This fine is August it, day. Is it August? I don't even know. It's still August. Yeah. Time means nothing anymore. <laughs> uh i'm doing all right i'm doing all right things have been kind of crazy the last couple of weeks but uh you know hanging in there it's fine how are you i'm not bad i am in upstate new york which is wonderful and quiet and there's like sun and there's like grass that i can walk on and it's so much fun i can go outside i could go outside into my parents yard without a mask on <laughs> I'm like oh my god what? <laughs> I know it's like it's a brave new world really honestly how many uh, fires are there around you there are no fires what? around me we I are thought a... the whole world was on fire <laughs> well uh, as as we I think discussed last time we are a very damp climate uh <laughs> so if there were fires like they, our climate will would seriously have to change I think it's I think we're going to go more in the direction of floods to be totally honest yeah I don't know which is worse honestly uh I, I don't think either is is particularly good we would like a nice balance yes you know, no floods least, and no fires very true but at least with floods you can still breathe the air that is true there is that that is true unless the air becomes water true <laughs> and then we've really got a problem <laughs> oh my god now i'm more worried about new york city actually being submerged than i am about this area this is my parents live kind of right in the middle of new york state so um it's it's not probably not going to be underwater anytime soon but one never nice. knows <laughs> um so karen you had a couple of things that you wanted to talk about before we got going on our topic for today so do you just want to take it away yeah so i just i know that people are really wondering um what's going on uh, clayton davis my boss at award circuit last week announced that he got a big fancy job at variety and I'm very excited for him. This is a really huge deal. It's hilarious that he has to move to California after swearing for years that he never would do any such thing. And uh, <laughs> next year he'll be living here and complaining about the traffic with all of us. Um, and but anyway, so with that, of course, the next question that some people that I've talked to have had is, "What's going to happen to me?" and um, and what does this mean to me? How am I feeling about it? And I have a lot of feelings. Most of them are really positive. I think that this is a, a very exciting thing. It's a great opportunity for all of us. I mean, a lot of the writing staff was already writing for other outlets and will continue to do so. Some of us um, are you have been trying to figure out what's our next move, um, especially those of us who'd been with the site for a long time. And I don't have an announcement to make on that right now, but um, I just wanted to take a minute to say that I'm also, I'm also feeling a little bit, uh, sad's not even the right word, but I definitely, there's, there's some, uh, it's bittersweet, I think, mm -hmm. that the award circuit is, is uh, shifting. We're still not even entirely sure what that's going to look like. Um, but it, it, Clayton gave me my first job in this industry. I've only, other than like doing Citizen Dame or, you know, I wrote an article for Variety this earlier this year. I've had a couple of things here and there, little things, but for the most part, Award Circuit has been my home for seven years and always with Clayton there. And it, so it's a little bit weird to think of that 
changing and us not working together anymore. And um, part of the reason I wanted to take a minute to talk about it here is not just because this is me and my life, but because award circuits actually indirectly responsible for this podcast. And um, for those of you who haven't been listening from the beginning, um, Kristen Lopez and I actually wrote together we worked together at award circuit that's how we met and um there had been there's a podcast there that they do and there was sort of this offshoot that clayton wanted to try out and some of the writers wanted to try and they called it minority report i was not involved in naming it (laughs) (laughs) um and it just it kind of didn't work it was me and and kristen and one other girl and it, for lots of reasons, it just wasn't quite fitting in with what we were trying to do at the time at Award Circuit. And so it just kind of dropped. And Kristen and Christina was the other the other writer. And I, we kept in touch. We kept talking. Kristen eventually quit Award Circuit. And Christina eventually quit Award Circuit. And we would always talk about wanting to do this podcast and we even named it we named it citizen dame that was christina lule's suggestion and uh we set up the twitter and the facebook page and all that but nothing ever happened and then all of a sudden one day uh three years ago Kristen, i was in india and Kristen sent this email and she's like hey i want to get this podcast going after we had tried and and not done it several times over like two years and then it finally did and so it's kind of weird it's like so much of what I do now and so much of of where I'm at in my life now is because of award circuit and so even though he never listens to podcasts (laughs) and he won't hear this I do have to just say thanks to Clayton for for helping me not only get my start but helping me to to build the confidence to do the things that I do, including this podcast that led me to becoming friends with you, Lauren Humphreys Brooks. Well, I have to say thank you to Clayton as well then, because like this has been, obviously this, I've enjoyed doing this and, and, uh, and I did not know the, I knew some of the history behind how you and and Kristen got this going, but, um, but I, you know, obviously I didn't, I came in basically when Kristen sent everybody, uh, a whole bunch of people an email and I was one of the people to respond and be like, oh, yeah, that'd be really interesting. And I, I love doing it. So thanks also, Clayton. Like this is, it's been a meandering path, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has. Kind of most of my life has been, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I feel that that's the way life generally is though. Like you're sort of like, oh, this happened because I did that one thing back in, you know, 2008 and <laughs> yeah, now here we are. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's pretty fun. So I, I love tracing back the origins of things. So mm-hmm. it's part of why I like family history. That's cool. Yeah. yeah so that's cool. the family history of Citizen Dame. <laughs> <laughs> that I was not even fully aware of. So, uh, Okay, so do we want to, let's move on to our our topic. Let's Uh, do. And our topic today uh, that we kind of, we've we've been talking about a whole bunch of different things. We talked about Hitchcock last time, we talked about German Expressionism. Now we're going to talk about the most American genre of all time, which is the Western. Yes. And the Western is, I think that the Western, much like pornography and much like horror films, you know it when you see it. Like, it's really (laughs) hard to, to just like, oh yeah, that is a Western. But it's amazing how influential the Western is across, uh, across Hollywood history, across world cinema history, because the Western has like morphed and become so ubiquitous um, across cultures, across, uh, and, and it's very weird because it's such a quintessentially American genre um, that is so embedded in the concept of America and, the con- and sort of the American mythology. And at the same time, it is not only borrowed from other cultures, but it has also contributed to other cultures in the sense that other cultures have taken the Western and Western genre and sort of run with it and done their own things with it. So it's a really fascinating genre. Um, so let's let's just kind of start off with really briefly, what are some of our favorite Westerns? Karen, do you have a particular Western that you're like, that is the best Western ever? 
Um, oh man. So <laughs> I have like categories of Westerns that I love. <laughs> so <laughs> makes sense, yeah. Yeah. So like as far as, you know, spanning the time of of Westerns, you know, I love Blazing Saddles because of <laughs> how it spoofs the western but i also love shane and and the searchers and um gosh like so many i love young guns i love um i actually really like dances with wolves um uh yeah so i i it's it's weird because it's like i never thought of myself as a western person i never thought of myself as someone who likes westerns until mm-hmm. i really started diving into like the films that i've seen and the movies that i enjoy and there are so many and like even a really recent one that i love is hostiles and i know you have a different opinion about hostiles but um at least i think you do i think we've talked about uh, it no i don't think that we have i haven't oh. seen it oh who was it then i don't know i thought it was you um yeah no i so it's it's a genre that from the very oldest ones to things that come out today i still i don't know i i I have found that i really like it i don't buy into the mythology but that's i think that's part of why i enjoy them it's like i I love the marvel movies too not because i you know believe in superheroes or anything but just because it's it's fun and it's especially with westerns it uh, maybe a lot of it is just because my mom is so into them. My grandpa was so into them. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's that connection to my family and it's this, you get to kind of like sit and pretend that <laughs> America was this wonderful place even back in the <laughs> old days, you know, it's kind of, you get to forget how, uh, how uh, problematic we've been over the, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. <laughs> Well, and I, th- I think I definitely want to talk about the, this, this whole, the concept of the Western is sort of the American mythos, the American mythology. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, your I, favorites? I, I think that's, I, I think that Westerns are so weirdly ubiquitous that we, we love them without even really thinking about it sometimes, like you're saying. And I think the part of it is that when we think of Westerns, we tend to think of the classic Western, you know, so um, Stagecoach and things like that, the kind of the lone gunman or something like that, John Wayne, Gary Cooper, all of those guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so many great Westerns are actually later than that, are actually sort of more interesting than that. And I've I've gotten to watch a whole bunch of Western noir and, um, uh, and other sort of more revisionist westerns that kind of got going in the the 1950s and the 1960s where there was kind of this undercutting and questioning of the mythology that the westerns established so one of my favorites right now uh and i saw this not that long ago was vera cruz with uh gary cooper and burt lancaster and it is the most homoerotic western i have ever seen (laughs) like without you know other than like brokeback mountain (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. It's like, it is the love story of Gary Cooper and Burt Lancaster, who are like, you know, Gary Cooper is basically this um, kind of old school Western hero, and Burt Lancaster is this um, uh, uh, outlaw who's kind of leading a gang of outlaws, and they, they go down to, to Mexico to, to essentially be mercenaries. And, but much of the film is about their relationship and is about them kind of you know that eventually they're going to wind up in a shootout. You know that eventually these two guys are going to hit head on, right? And, uh, and, and but just the two of them, there is so much that is like them comparing guns and <laughs> them like fighting over women and, but they're not really fighting over women. We're just like, oh my God, just kiss, just kiss. Just like give in to the love, seriously. <laughs> there is so much love here. Um, but it's, it's a great, it's a great Western. One of my other favorites that we're going to talk a little bit about because I love it is, uh, Johnny Guitar, which is arguably one of the, the earliest feminist Westerns, certainly one of the best known ones. And that's really enjoyable because, um, the two main sort of, uh, con- the main conflict really is between two women. Um, it's between Joan Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge. And again, I haven't seen it. it is, it is remarkable. Oh my God, you have to see Johnny Guitar. Like Johnny Guitar is the height of like, it, 
people call it camp, but I think that that's kind of disowning it. That's sort of putting it in a box. It's like, no, this is fantastic. This is like everything that the Western should be, only you don't realize it. Uh, it's, it's like totally lush. It's like technicolor colors and um, ridiculously extreme melodrama, and, but actually a really well-made film. It's directed by Nicholas Ray. And, uh, and really a great skewering also sort of the, that kind of masculine archetype um, represented in this film by Sterling Hayden, who is uh, a, who's a gunslinger who no longer carries a gun, he carries a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's very much about like this, basically this fight that develops between, between Joan Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge uh, over uh, a, a band of outlaws, essentially. Hmm. It is a remarkable film. So that was one of my favorites. Um, but the Western has been around for ages. It has been around. One of the earliest films is actually a Western. So, um, and it was, it was made in Britain in 1899. It was called Kidnapping by Indians. So unsurprising. And then of course you have the, the Great Train Robbery, uh, which is 1903. And- I think, sorry. Yeah. Well, I think the Great Train Robbery is part of why people tend to think that Americans developed film, like invented film, basically. Yeah. I think that it, it, you can trace it back to that specific movie. Well, it's such a, it's so famous, and it's also the fact that it's preserved. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have the entirety of the Great Train Robbery still exists and everything, but it's, it is really interesting that one of the earliest films, and certainly one of the most famous early films, is a Western. Um, and, and so that kind of begins the development of this whole concept of the West as, uh, as both this, this fight between civilization and, and outlawism. And outlaws can take, uh, you, it, can, it can be simply the land, uh, or it can also be uh, criminals, or very often Native Americans. And I think, I think we should probably talk about the race issues <laughs> in Westerns in oh, a minute. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, but so, the, you know, it's, it's that kind of quintessential fight between, between, you know, and we'll put quotation marks around this, civilization and wildness and, um, and the wilderness of the West. And it's, it, it almost always has taken place in, uh, in this concept of Western, of Westward expansion in American cinema. And so there's, there's this whole idea of the, the founding of America. This becomes kind of America's foundational myth. And it's interesting because it's, it's far more so than the American Revolution, like at least in cinema. We don't have a lot of American revolutionary films. Um, there are a few, but they're not as ubiquitous as the Western. The Western really is the foundational myth of America. Yeah, and it, well, and I think the reason, at least to me, one of the reasons probably is the Revolution era, it's like, we learn about that in history class and there's a pretty finite set of facts. You can always learn more stories about people that were involved, but we know what happened and every version of that story ends up with us in a big war. And of course we love war movies because they still think that world war two is the only movie to make or only war to make movies about. But, um, but the, uh, but yeah, so every version of the revolution has a giant war in it, which is fine. But with Westerns, there are so many different types of stories you can tell. There are romances, there are kidnappings, yeah. there are heist movies, there are adventure stories. There are so many different types of, of stories you can tell in this just a big umbrella of the Western that it just naturally leads to lots and lots of different movies and, and so many that like, even if you like Westerns, you wouldn't necessarily like all Westerns because, well, I like Westerns, but I don't like, um, I don't like chase movies or I don't like mm -hmm. romance or whatever. So yeah. So it's got like all these subgenres underneath it. Yeah, no, exactly. It's a, it's a very um, fluid genre. Mm -hmm. And, and like you say, it's one that can, that it also, like you're saying, it doesn't take up a finite space. Like what is, 
what is the West, right? It, so westward expansion is, is 19th century, right? It's 19th century yeah. America. But at a certain point, you can begin to develop, and we talk about 20th century Westerns and kind of the movement of Westerns into it, pushing into other genres. And, um, and when, you know, are you talking about cowboys, you know, the kind of cowboys and Indians sort of concept? Or are you talking about just representing the dangers of, um, uh, of frontiers people moving from the east to the west and all of the various dangers including you know disease and uh, floods and fires and all of those things that, that they encountered on their movement westward and and simply the the activity of settling in sections of the country and the dangers that accompanied that um, of course this this is an extensively white mythology oh yeah uh, because a lot of the times, and, and you know, we could talk about it about the uh, the representations of the native peoples, whoever they might be. It's always the Comanches or the Cherokees, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, and you and you get very vague. Sometimes it's just the Indians. <laughs> yeah, usually I would say it's just the Indians, and um, be partly because people just don't. <laughs> White people are really bad at knowing the difference between tribes and groups of people. And yeah, so it's just easier to just vilify those people over there, you know? Yeah, the, those people, whoever those mm -hmm. people were. But so the, so let's, I mean, let's talk about the representation of Native Americans generally. Yes. Because then we almost have to talk about it generally, because like, like you say, they are just, they're treated as this kind of blanket um, concept. Yeah. Right? particularly in early Western, so in, in the classical period where there's a lot of, you know, Indian attacks on stagecoaches or on um, wagon trains or on, you know, fighting between um, the local, the, the local indigenous people and uh, what, whoever the settlers are, depending upon where they are. And I mean, at, at least initially there, you know, it's, natives tend to be represented as savage, as these almost a part of the land uh, in the sense that they are resisting the concept of white civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, one of the most famous ones that, that begins to complicate that, that representation a little bit is the searchers. Yeah. Uh, that on the one hand, this is a story about, about a, a, a girl who's literally abducted by, by uh, Native Americans and her entire family is slaughtered, her mother is raped, and it's about these, these three men who then turn around and go off in search of her. Uh, and it takes them years to, to locate her. So by the time they have actually found her, she is growing up and she, she's turned into Natalie Wood. Uh, <laughs> and but so, so that's a really interesting film in terms of both the representation of a more complex characterizations of Native Americans than you tend to you tended to get earlier than that, um, but also you have Native Americans being played by white people, and you still have this attitude of them being these these savage figures that are abducting girls, and um, and are violently hated by the heroes of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it yeah, <laughs> it's hard to talk about loving movies like the searchers and also having to look at that specific um that that problem of the way that these people are represented and how and one of the problems with it is how that has affected the way a lot of people understand history or think they understand history because the movies have brainwashed people into believing that uh this was just common that the indians were attacking white settlements all the time and it's not that it never happened it's just that the reasons behind it were a lot more complicated and the frequency with which it happened was a lot less than the movies would like us to think um and i, well, I, mean, I was gonna yeah. make a point now i lost it <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you've got you've got a film when you're where you basically got these three white men. So um, uh, I think it's John John Wayne is the head, uh, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Hunter, and I can't remember who else who's the third man. But um, but you see, so you've got this, these three white men going out in search of this girl, right, who has been abducted, and and the implication is that at a certain point she's been raped. 
Right. Um, and, and you've got a Lisa John Wayne character who hates, hates Comanches. Like he is a violently hateful of Comanches. And you have, on the other hand, this, these sort of interesting representations of the, the, lead, uh, the lead Comanche, Scar, who is played by um, Henry Brandon, who's a white man. Uh, he's, n he's not a native actor, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's another problem. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think we'll talk about, I have another film I want to talk about in a minute in terms of that. Mm -hmm. um, but so in terms, of, in terms of the way that the film represents these characters, the John Wayne character is not particularly likable. Right, the level of hatred that he has for uh, for the Comanches is really frightening, almost. Yeah, and you understand it on 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 the one side, but it's also horrifying on the other. And you kind of feel the same way I think with Scar that he has he has a hatred for white people, and some of what the film uh, is representing is this absorption into Comanche culture of this this white girl who becomes, you know, becomes a Comanche, becomes native. Uh, and the violence with which the John Wayne character responds to that and the violence which, with which uh, Scar is responding to that. So it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what the film is doing uh, other than complicating these kinds of relationships. Yeah, but it's good that it's, that it's showing the complications because so yeah. many of these, of these early Western films uh, didn't. It was just white guy good indian bad there's no nuance there there's no yeah. interrogating why the native americans were doing what they were doing if they were doing it at all and there's no there's no responsibility taken by the white people for anything that has happened it's just you know there's so I, i'm trying to think of some specific examples right now and i'm drawing a blank but there's there's just a lot of that where it's it's just like we said this nebulous like generic indian that's just out to get the white man and the searchers does definitely start to say like well <laughs> there's more to it than that yeah it's it's more complicated than that and and uh and well and i i think that a lot of some some of the earlier westerns that that feature quote, Indian attacks, right? Um, very often they are, fa they're pretty much faceless, right? They're just, yeah. you, you sort of get this image of this guy on a horse with a feather in his hair and, you know, war paint on. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the image that you have of sort of the Western Indian. And, and part of that is probably because they were played by white people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh yes a lot of the time they were although although they did high often sometimes hire like and you see this in a lot of westerns where even though the lead character the lead uh you know like comanche or cherokee is a white guy is a white actor in in red face mm -hmm. um a lot of the background characters yeah. are actual <laughs> like actually and they're probably not comanches right <laughs> cherokees they're like whatever whoever is like hanging around where they're filming basically and they're and so they're hiring these um these native actors to portray them and very often are speaking their own language so you will often hear in the background you know you, someone's playing a Cherokee and you can hear people actually speaking Hopi or Navajo or Zoom okay so so yes yeah, so my my mother actually has a friend who is uh, Navajo and her uncle um uh, used to be a, a background extra in westerns, and so he's he's a background character in a number of these sort of John Ford, you know, Monument Valley westerns. And they would often the the uh, the native actors would usually be told you just oh speak Indian, right? <laughs> and so they would they would speak in their own language, and usually it was insulting the white actors. <laughs> uh, so you would actually and I and I guess that when they would show these films on the reservation, the uh, the, the Navajo would begin laughing because what they were hearing in the background is these guys are like, uh, you know, they're supposedly saying, oh, we are friends of the white man. What they're actually saying is this white man is so fucking stupid, he can't ride a horse. <laughs> um, and, and I just, I love that. I love that idea that like every time I hear, you know, actual like Navajo or something like that being spoken on screen, I'm just like, they're probably saying something really insulting right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome and so, totally deserved <laughs> yeah so i really like that but one of the interesting things i think that does happen in the 1950s is that you begin to get these movies like the searchers that that even if they don't you know i i don't think you can argue that the searchers is uh subversive but 
it, it is beginning to question some of those Western tropes and particularly surrounding not just the native characters, but also the, the whole concept of this, this lone gunman who rides into town and who rides into town, cleans everything up and then leaves. Um, one of the really interesting films uh, made around the same period is Devil's Doorway, which was made in 1950, so six years earlier than The Searchers, uh, by Anthony Mann. And it is actually about um, a, a uh, I can't remember what he's supposed to be. He is a Shoshone uh, who comes back from the Civil War and has been, he's a decorated soldier. And he comes back to kind of take over his father's land. And so, but because he is Shoshone, it basically turns out that he's not allowed to homestead. He's not allowed to claim his own land. Um, and it turns into this, this conflict between, uh, between, the between the Shoshone and the, um, the homesteaders who are trying to move in on it. And it really represents these, these uh, characters as much more nuanced and, much, and the fight much more complicated and uh and distressing because you're essentially saying that like you know you're not he's not he he's not considered an american citizen yeah you know and he's not allowed to own land he's not allowed to to sort of act as as a full american even though obviously this is this is someone whose people have been on this land long before the white people mm -hmm. uh the complication of this is that the character is played by robert taylor oh no who is a white actor, as we all know. So it's, it's a very interesting film and it's interesting for what it explores, even again, if it doesn't go as far as I think that we should, we should hope these films could have gone. Um, but so, so when you get into the 1950s, you get into sort of these more complicated views of the mythos of the West. Uh, and I mean, let's, let's talk about Western mythology, how we actually view this whole idea of the West. Um, like I've, I've, I've made the argument that, that this is um, American myth making, that this is kind of our foundational myth. Uh, so what, I don't know, what do you think about that? What is that like, this, this seems to be like one of those things that we base so much of our concept of self on. Yeah, uh, well, I think that this comes back to what we had talked about um, a little bit when we did our bonus episode on patriotic films. I think that the Western definitely um, has ties to that too. And I think that so much of the reason is because it's also, a, it's a genre that was exported a lot mm -hmm. to other countries. And so it became how other countries saw us too. And what they knew of America was wide open spaces with lots of room to be free. And, and that was part of the point of, of Westerns was that it was these these people that were out on the frontier that were far far away from like washington and they they kept their own law and they kept things in order themselves and they took everything you know they they took action they did what they needed to do for themselves they didn't need the government to come in and and step in and take care of them and so that's kind of this um this idea that goes into those types of stories and mm -hmm. um and so it 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 does create this idea of what the expanding uh, country was in the 19th century and, and um, for, <laughs> for better or for worse. And it definitely helps us to have this very, um, when it's not being racist, this very nicely <laughs> packaged uh, idea of of who we were and and what the west was all about and why westward expansion was so great and mm -hmm. and it helps us to ignore the fact that we did a lot of really terrible things as we were moving across the continent yeah it's it's that rugged individualism of of yeah. um, the american character that that sort of we're going to forge our way through land and 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 also you know the the concept of manifest destiny that 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 we are somehow and this is again this is about white people right mm -hmm. um but that we are are destined to to control this entire continent right we are destined to uh push we will to tame push the wild mm -hmm. yeah exactly to push the the indigenous people out to 
establish ourselves as the owners of this land, you know, and, and it is, it's very similar in a lot of ways to a lot of other uh, national mythologies that that uh, are self-justifying, that essentially say like, you know, we, are, we were born to be here, this is our land. Um, even though, you know, we're kind of, and, and it goes back to, you know, in terms of the representation of, um, of the indigenous people, it goes back to that sort of like, well, if the indigenous people are these wild savages who are trying to murder people, then it's okay, you know, it's, it's this, this self-justification of, well, it's, it's okay that we killed all of them, gave them diseases, and shoved them onto reservations. Right. <laughs> um, which, you know, isn't that, isn't no. that convenient? <laughs> isn't it convenient? They're like, oh, well, they were just terrible. They were not even people, really. Like, we did it for their benefit. We yeah, helped exactly. them. Exactly. But it, it is also interesting then, so when you get this, this whole concept, this underlying mythology that is the basis of America, right? that then you begin to get films that, that undercut that and that represent just like, well, it was actually a lot more complicated than that. And maybe we're not so great. Uh, maybe these things are not such a good thing. You know, they were things that happened. Um, and, and you begin to see that particularly moving into the 1960s and the 1970s, where there's a lot more pushing and pulling going on of being like, you know, we're valorizing this whole idea of taking over the land, but what we're valorizing are very violent, very um, uh, dangerous and, and outlaws, right? Pe people who literally, there were some people who literally were driven out of the East because, <laughs> because they were dangerous. And so they're going off into, you know, this whole concept of going off into this lawless land where you can basically be an outlaw. You can be a killer, you can be a rapist, et cetera, and not really have to face legal ramifications of that. Yeah. Um, and that's what you begin to see in, in the 1950s and then through the 1970s is this, I, this kind of thing develops. Yeah. I think the other thing that you see, though, too, is a lot more Westerns that just ignore Indians and pretend that they're not out there. Yeah. Too. Um, well, we killed all of them. Though. <laughs> right. Yeah. There you go. Um, they conquered the land and now it's, it's free and safe. Um, it, and I hope I don't have to tell people, like, yeah, we're being very tongue in cheek when we say that. Um, but uh because obviously we have a lot of respect for the native americans uh at least i hope yes. that's obvious the the white people did kill them like that's yes what happened. We, were we were terrible we <laughs> showed up really we took place. over their land we shoved them onto reservations we gave them horrible diseases and then we turned around and we're just like oh they were the savages you know yeah. so yeah <laughs> Yeah, and um, and use that as justification for doing all the things that we did. But that's the thing. So it's like when you get into the later westerns, um, you see what you were just talking about. There's more of like interrogating in in or at least expressing that everything that was happening wasn't always um, good and right but also there's a lot of just starting to move past including Native Americans in those stories at all and mm -hmm. just making it about the settlers and going out and like you get more I'm trying to think of, again I'm trying to think of examples <laughs> um, but uh, well a good example it, is, is kind of one of the classic westerns Shane mm -hmm, yeah um, which is very a quintessential Western. It's the kind of mysterious lone gunman who doesn't like using a gun. Yeah. Uh, coming into town and fixing everything and then yeah. riding out again. And, but that, that has very little to do. I don't even, I, I'm not certain if there's any sort of uh, indigenous peoples attacking. Uh, if there is, it's a very minor, it's a minor, it's a minor topic, but it's, it's this fight between civilization and the wildness, but the wildness here is represented by outlaws. Right. Or, like, you get movies like uh, Magnificent Seven, True Grit, yeah. stuff like that, where, yeah, it's, it's about the outlaws that usually in these cases are white. And so it's, it's a way of kind of moving past um, our very negative representation of the Native people without actually addressing it. Yeah. Just like, let's just ignore that part. Yeah, we'll it's... just, you know, we'll just move past that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, so like there, we begin to get these really, uh, these really interesting representations. And one of the things, so we mentioned the Magnificent Seven. This is a good segue. Uh, 
let's talk about the fact that a number of the most famous Westerns, certainly, but a number of particularly later Westerns are actually based on Japanese films. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically the films of, of Kurosawa. So you've got The Magnificent Seven, which is based on Seven Samurai. Uh, you've got a number of Clint Eastwood films, and I always forget the juxtaposition, but both Yojimbo and Sanjuro uh, were then remade into Clint Eastwood films, uh, were made into spaghetti westerns, which were filmed in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> with largely Italian casts other than Clint Eastwood and some of the other characters. So you, get, you begin to get this kind of weird exchange going on between, you know, samurai films, which are very specific to Japan, right? Mm -hmm. And American Westerns, which are very specific to America. And so it's such a it's such an odd kind of combination, but it's interesting the way that the the two very different cultures have this this concept of and and again it's the concept of this lone gunman or lone swordsman comes into town cleans up the town um, from because it's being ravaged by gangs it's being ravaged by uh, by outlaws etc kind of saves the people and then leaves so mm -hmm. it I. I never quite know how to navigate that because it's such a weird combination of things. You're just like, we have these two very different cultures, but we manage to like have the same basic stories, you know? Yeah. Well, it's fun because um, the, it's, it's these people that were really big fans of each other. Yeah. And so it's like Kurosawa was a contemporary of some of the American Western filmmakers and vice versa. And they respected each other. And so it's not like they were just straight up copying and stealing from each other. It was like they were taking inspiration from one another. And which is interesting because that's not something that I even understood until, you know, just really fairly recently I started looking at, um, I was watching something about Seven Samurai, and actually, I th I think this is accurate. Uh, I should look it up before I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I'm pretty sure that the original name for Seven Samurai translated to The Magnificent Seven, and then when they made The Magnificent Seven here in the United States and it ended up being a big hit, um, Kurosawa really liked the movie so much that he changed the name of his own film so that it wouldn't confuse people. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I believe that. I think that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's, and, and it's interesting because they are, both of those films are very clearly transposed. Like it's yeah. very clear. Like if you watch Seven Samurai, you watch Magnificent Seven, it's the same film in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Only one is taking place in kind of the, the frontier of Japan and one of them is taking place in the frontier of America. Uh, and you've got guns instead of swords. Right. Um, they're, but they're, they're juxtaposed, but they're so specific to where they're from. That's what's yeah. so interesting, too, about them, is that they definitely are the same story. But then it, it, to me, that also makes you really think, like, see, around the world, we try to divide ourselves and talk about how we have all these differences, but we really don't. We have... Mm -hmm shared similarities in our histories and in our mythologies and in just who we are as individuals and i think if we accepted more of that and embraced more of that we'd have fewer problems i don't know yeah no it's true well i and i mean you can we could keep on spinning this out and you know so many you we see this across cultures where yeah we, we all have similar stories right we tell a fair you tell a fairy tale in uh, in one culture and the same kind of fairy tale pops up in another culture mm -hmm. and these cultures don't necessarily have any major interaction or anything like that but this we tell the same kinds of stories mm -hmm. um, and they mean different things and they represent different things but we're st it's still the same basic structure uh, but what, what's interesting I think when it comes to the western and, and we've talked about this in terms of the cultural exchange uh, in a lot of films that, you know, so you've got this really interesting fluidity of we're going to move, so we're going to move from Japan to America, and then from America back to Japan, and then to China, and, and you, you get these subgenres of the Western that are being made in other countries, so you get, um, you get Japanese adaptations, basically, of the Western genre, you get Chinese adaptations of the Western genre, you get Italian adaptations of the Western genre, and, and so you begin to get into what is really classified as a Western, 
right? Mm -hmm. How do we how do we talk about Western as a genre when you have all of these disparate kind of cultures and concepts and ways that they represent things, but still kind of based in this this whole somewhat nebulous and fluid concept of you know the westward expansion of america yeah um i don't don't know it's it's interesting and and um you know you could tease it back even further to talk about uh to talk about the cowboy the lone gunman the 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 hero etc of a western being very arthurian (laughs) Uh, as sort of the knight errant, and it has a lot of relationships to that. So, I don't know, at a certain point, we kind of go like, oh, everything is interconnected. <laughs> yep, it's just a big map with, like, all the strings tying everything together, and yeah. Yeah, exactly. But so, so when we get into the, into, like, the late 70s, and even into the contemporary period, there are, there's a lot of argument about the West, the Western, the American Western, right, being killed. Mm -hmm. Um, And the whole idea was that the American Western kind of ended with Unforgiven, uh, which is the Clint Eastwood film, which is kind of the, certainly it's the nail in the coffin of the stranger motif. Um, And it it was intended to be, but almost immediately you get more Westerns being made. So uh, there's there's a good argument for uh, the Coen brothers, No Country for Old Men being a Western. you get even later than that, you know, re- more recently you have uh, the remake of True Grit by the Coen brothers. You've also got um, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Uh, the, uh, hostiles. Hus- yeah, Hostiles. Mm-hmm. So then, then you can begin to get into like the very contemporary moment, Bone Tomahawk, mm-hmm. um, which is a Western of sorts. It's a horror Western. Um, of course, you have all the comedy Westerns like Blazing Saddles, which is... Let's talk about Blazing Saddles for a moment, Let's just because it's so much fun. <laughs> I love that movie so much. So, I mean, Blazing Saddles is kind of the quintessential comedy western. Like, it's it's a parody, but it also obviously loves what it's parodying, which is what makes it so good. That's why, in general, Mel Brooks is so good at parody because he doesn't he doesn't do things he doesn't really care about you know he loves the frankenstein story so that's why young frankenstein works and Mm -hmm. he clearly loves westerns or at least has a a very strong admiration of them and that's why that's why he's able to make blazing saddles what it is because he understands the genre and that's the thing it's like no one can make fun of my brother but me you know like my actual brother (laughs) you know and other people make fun of him but i can like just tease him all day and it's because i know him and i i you know i know what his strengths and what his weaknesses are and i know how to exploit them and how to celebrate them and it's Mm -hmm. the same thing like when it comes to parody you have to really appreciate what you're doing you know i've seen parody films that are like why did you even make this you clearly don't like romantic comedies or whatever you know and um yeah blazing saddles it's <laughs> oh man i mean i think that so many people talk about blazing saddles because it's such it's such a famous film and it's it is still so funny uh <laughs> But, but so like, you know, some of the things that, that we're talking about, you know, in terms of the representation of Native Americans, the representation of Black people, which Black people are almost yeah. non-existent. Yeah, in they a pretend lot of they Westerns. just weren't there. Yeah, just, mm-hmm. just, there was no such, there was no such thing as Black people. Every Asian once in a while. people too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was the Chinese immigrants who built the railway system in America, and we just, they're not in the movies, like, and if they yeah. are, it's never a well very rarely a good representation so i i honestly and i'm certain that there are films that that represent it but i honestly just sitting here i cannot think of a western that really represents that fact you know there's always that representation of the building of the railroads but usually the railroads it's just sort of they're just being built (laughs) Mm -hmm. there's they just kind of are popping up somewhere they're existing (laughs) yeah and and there's very little like you say there's very little actual representation of the fact that it was it was Chinese immigrants building them Mm -hmm. um uh, but but Blazing Saddles does actually address some of the issues. So it doesn't address the Chinese issue, but but does address the issue of, of race and of the racism of Westerns and the racism of that period as well. Uh, in, a, in a very funny, but also a very specific way. 
mm-hmm. um, in, in terms of a, a, a black man becoming sheriff in this small town. Uh, it, it also addresses the presence of Marlena Dietrich in Westerns, which I think is, is very, very important because <laughs> the, the character that Madeline Kahn plays is Marlena Dietrich. And mm-hmm. to the degree that I cannot watch Marlena Dietrich in Westerns without giggling. <laughs> uh, because I always hear Madeline Kahn. There's, there's a song that Marlena Dietrich sings in Rancho Notorious that I just can't watch because I keep on cracking up because all I could think of is Madeline Kahn singing, I'm so tired. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's, a, it's seriously, like watch Marlena Dietrich in some of her Westerns and then watch, watch Madeline Kahn and it's like, okay, I can't, can't do this. <laughs> Um, of course, some of it's, the jokes. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. Some of the jokes in Blazing Saddle we cannot repeat, uh, even <laughs> though even though you kind of like to just say I cannot say that as a white person, but it's funny. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Then... Go on. Oh, I was just saying, but there's just also just just the fact that like, um, just the, just the the setup of it. The yes, it's it's about this town that ends up bringing in a black sheriff but everything that goes into why he ends up there in the first place and then the the broader implications of him being there this this is a movie that's actually um i mean it's it's this simple funny story but it's also it's it's complicated in some of the elements because you've got the governor and um you've got these these bad guys and coming after the town and um it really does actually confront some of the the racist issues it doesn't just mock them or um or try to subvert them it it actually deals with it yeah exactly it's not it it isn't making it isn't punching down and it isn't making light of the racism Mm -hmm. um it's kind of confronting it head on because as soon as you're like because because you know as a viewer also the the very concept of a black man becoming a sheriff in a a western frontier town kind of like oh this is not a good idea like it's it's automatically funny in in a certain sense because you're like oh racism you know but it actually does deal with those topics yeah um without without like like i say without making them the butt of the joke it's not ah ha ha aren't these people racist just like these people are really racist and this is part of our foundational myth yeah and this movie came out in 1974 which yes it was post you know um segregation and all that but the country was still very we're still racist and you know in the 70s we hadn't gotten past that it wasn't better and yet this movie was able to exist and became a big hit i think because of how it how it handles the subject matter but um i think that it's part of the the brilliance of mel brooks that he's able to um kind of skewer people without them even noticing what he's doing Mm mm-hmm I mean, one of, one of my favorite lines in that entire film is spoken by Gene Wilder, uh, and and he sa- he says he says you have to remember that these are simple people, um, these are the the common clay of the New West, you know, morons, <laughs> and it's so true, and it's so like funny, and I think that he actually cracks up uh, uh, Clavon Little, who's playing, uh-huh. um, I, and. And he like, like he actually begins laughing, and it is true. But it's true. It's just like this is yes, exactly. These people are morons. <laughs> These are not <laughs> smart people, right? It's just yeah. like you're you're asking them to accept something that they are too stupid to accept. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and in that way, it's also doing that to the audience, and it works, and it's brilliant. And it, and it is, it's skewering that mythology, that like, just like, we were brave frontiers people, just like, no, we were morons, <laughs> we were idiots, <laughs> our ancestors were dumb. Yep. <laughs> the fact that we're here is a miracle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, we're kind of, we're just sort of jumping around everywhere. I want to talk really briefly about feminist westerns. Is there such a thing as a feminist western? Go. 
Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Show your work. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yes, there is. I do not feel that I've seen enough of them, but, uh, but I think of, of movies like what Kelly Reichert's doing, um, Mm -hmm. with, with there was Meek's cutoff, um, earlier this year, first cow, which have you seen that one? I haven't seen it yet, although it's on my list. Okay. First cow is kind of a weird example to use because of the fact that it's about men. Um, (laughs) and they're really, I'm trying to even remember if there were any women in it besides the cow, but, um, (laughs) but I think that it's, there's just something different about when you have these traditionally very male and masculine stories being told from a female perspective and Mm -hmm. there's um there's a tendency to have more uh interrogation of the problems um and you don't have as much of like oh this guy is the hero therefore he is perfect and wonderful you know um but yeah, so I, I definitely think there are examples. I'm trying to think of other filmmakers besides Kelly Riker. <laughs> right I mean, now. you you could you could make an argument for films like The Nightingale as westerns. Yes. Oh, definitely. Sort of yeah. Category of western. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, because makes... there's like especially like out of Australia, because yeah. they have obviously not the same foundation because they started off as like that was a criminal penal colony, but um but once once the british started settling there they have a similar path to what we had and there was a lot of the um uh exploration of the continent and and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so so yeah i think there's there's definitely a frontier element to australia's history just like there is here so there's some really interesting westerns um out of australia as well sweet yeah. country is another one that's not a feminist film but um just another australian western i can think of um yeah no i and i i do think that one of the interesting things that westerns do is is, is talk about masculinity and representations of masculinity mm-hmm. um and so i mentioned vera cruz which is you know you, you kind of it's one of those films that has a question mark on it because it's like you got gary cooper and burt lancaster who are very masculine men right Yep. It is a very homoerotic film and it feels it it feels like it's supposed to be. It doesn't feel like, you know, there that there's a deliberate a, a deliberateness to it. Um you get the same kind of feeling in a film like Red River uh with with John Wayne and Montgomery Clift and that's that's one where where it's like John Wayne has no idea what's going on but I'm pretty positive that Montgomery Clift does. Uh <laughs> and and so the in some ways, you know, this for such, it's such a masculine genre, but there's a lot of interrogation or the potential for interrogation of masculinity. Um, and, you know, someone like John Wayne, who's very representative of the sort of stoic Western masculinity, but then you begin to get kind of more interesting representations of that. Um, and the one that I, that I mentioned earlier and that I, I do want to mention again is Johnny Guitar. So you've got this story that is pretty much focused on the fight between uh, between Joan Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge. In the middle of it are the men. So you've got one um, one outlaw who is, I, I, I'm trying to remember what he called, the, the dancing kid. Um, and on the one side, and, and he's sort of, he's like the, he's, he's not really the romantic lead, but he's like the semi-romantic interest of the two characters. <laughs> mm. uh, and then you also have Johnny Guitar who shows up and Johnny Guitar is, is in some ways a, a Shane figure in that he's a gunslinger who no longer carries a gun. Um, and he's kind of rejected all of that, but there's all of this talk and sort of implications about masculinity, about refusing to hold a gun, refusing to carry a gun and what that means. Um, and you've got someone like Sterling Hayden, who Sterling Hayden, if no, if you've never seen Sterling Hayden in a film, Sterling Hayden is like six foot three with shoulders out to here. I mean, he he's kind of the, again, he's a very quintessentially masculine screen presence. And the entire film, he's walking around with this guitar slung on his back that he occasionally strums and drinking, you know, coffee out of delicate china cups. So there is definitely this interrogation of masculinity that's going on. 
Yeah. Um, and the entire film ends with a shootout, not between the two male characters, but between the two female ones. Hmm. So it, it's a really fascinating, um, it's a really fascinating film. And I think that it is, I would argue that it is a very feminist film in the sense that it is, it's not, it's not turning a character like Sterling Hayden in like Johnny Guitar into a, a feminine figure. It's essentially saying that, that he doesn't have to be this representation of toxic, of toxic masculinity, that the conflict can actually be between these women and what the women represent, not what the men represent. Yeah. So this is just me saying like, everybody go watch Johnny Guitar um you need to for sure <laughs> I, I think it's I, it was on hulu for a while it tends it tends to be one of those films that just migrates Jumpster. amongst yeah <laughs> migrates among streaming services i think that it's still on hulu but it's it's uh it is a wonderful film it also happens to be a not very coded um <laughs> allegory about the mccarthy hearings <laughs> so, yeah. it is see, currently on hulu and prime video there you go. See, so you, no, no, no one has any excuse not to watch Johnny Guitar. It is fantastic. Uh, I saw it originally in, a, in actually a class on genre that that we the genre that we talked about was the western. So we watched Johnny Guitar. We watched My Darling Clementine and Johnny Guitar, which is a fascinating double feature. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I will watch it today. So, any like any more thoughts on the Western? We've kind of covered all kinds of things in this conversation. Um, it is still a, a, an existent genre. This is something that I don't think is ever going to go away in any sense. Yeah, no, I think there's always going to be. It's just like war movies, especially World War II movies. Um, it's something that will always exist. There will always be westerns, um, but but the western is shifting and. Um, I think I'm thinking of some recent examples that are <laughs> they're sort of like a combination of like big sprawling epic and some of like smaller you know more intimate films but mm -hmm. it's definitely something that still exists you know some recent examples there's The Revenant um, oh, yeah. which I have definite opinions about um, <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah, I think The Revenant certainly fits into this category of, of Western. Um, uh, Hostiles, I mentioned before, which is a movie that I love that really does share some similarities with older Westerns. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, Christian Bale plays this old, you know, Confederate captain or whatever. Um, and he now kind of works for i think he works for the marshal service and he has to escort this this chief back to his homeland this guy has been in prison and he's being released back to his home the reservation up in like wyoming and so they're they're having to get him there and there's a lot of animosity and anger and um these two men hate each other and christian bale's character also has you know very negative feelings toward the native americans in general but his his feeling toward this particular chief is very specific and the two have this really bad history together and it's interesting watching them um have to figure out ways to just accept each other as they're on this journey and there's other people involved like there's a couple of men that are with Christian Bale and it's not just the chief it's also his wife and his son and then they end up picking up someone else along the way who's um that's a whole other side story with Rosamund Pike so it's it's this group of people and they have a lot of reasons to to hate each other and I think that it's it does a really good job of of exploring that and again like what we were talking about with the searchers like christian bale's character in this is not just this amazing perfect hero um i think what happens with him at the end is a little bit um too cheery and rosy and glossed over but i think that it also does present him as someone who has a lot of flaws and has done a lot of of bad things himself and mm -hmm. so 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that you see a lot more of that in the movies that are coming now, that there's a lot more willingness to really confront um, our history and our past and um, be more honest about it. That's really interesting. I, I, I'm going to check that out. I, I feel like, when did, did this film come out last year? Uh, it was like two or three years ago. I feel like that this was a film that I heard talked about and I, I was like, I should see that. And then I just never saw it. Yeah. Um, Cause it sounds, it does sound really interesting. So I'm definitely going to check that out. It has the most beautiful score. I saw the movie, the first time I saw it, it was at AFI film festival and it was the gala screening and I'm sitting in the theater waiting for it to start. And they just had music playing and I was like, and it's this beautiful like cellos and um i just started thinking i bet this is the score for the movie and then it was and it's max richter who anybody who knows me like i am obsessed with max richter i love him and it's this was i think the first score of his that i heard and it's so beautiful um it does open with a really brutal brutal scene involving rosamund pike but um once you get past that it's i i think it's a really good movie and and that opening scene i think matters too it's not just there for the sake of being brutal which i think a lot of earlier films that would have obviously they they didn't show a lot of blood but um there was a lot of insinuated blood and violence and it was really just for the sake of making an entire group of people look bad this Mm -hmm. has um this sets the stage and really helps you understand kind of what's going on in this particular circumstance, but it also, um, there's a point to it. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to talk it out. Yeah. There's, there's so many interesting directions I think that the Western can go, um, now. And, and I would like to see, you know, so we talking about feminist Westerns and, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. There's a lot of opportunity for, for particularly female filmmakers to take this on, both in terms of talking about masculinity, but also talking about the women who participated in the in frontiersmanship, in the, in the foundations of the West for good and ill, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so much of the Western is about men and about the way that men behave and the, and the way that men relate. And, and we should, I, there should be more about women. <laughs> there definitely always should. True. Yeah. Well, there definitely should because there's so much of like, it's the men going off. Like I think about the movie 310 to Yuma and it's like this husband goes off to help escort this prisoner. Well, what about his wife who's back home with the kids? Like what's, what's she doing while her husband's off on this, this mission, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's one of the, I think it's one of the little house on the prairie books or maybe it was something just in a similar vein but i remember um one of the stories was obviously i don't remember it very well but <laughs> one of the stories was like pa takes off and he's gone for like two weeks and they're trying to you know live and survive in this unknown place by themselves for like two weeks and and i think that there's some real interesting stories to tell in that like when the women are left to their own devices and how that how they manage to cope in a world where we don't expect women to have the resources or or the the wherewithal to do it but of course they do because women just get shit done when we have to (laughs) even when we don't have to we, we get shit done Absolutely. Who the hell do you think kept the men alive for a lot exactly. of this period? Who gave birth to the babies? Like that's exactly. You know, come on, guys. Uh, and they so, had to do that with no modern medicine. And oh man, it's like man, it was really hard riding the range. Did you have to give birth to a baby <laughs> and then go back nothing? to the fields? Yeah. Just exactly. like, oh, I'm sorry. I just had to give birth to this child in the middle of this half-built log cabin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep <laughs> with no one around by myself by myself God. um so i think that that just about wraps us up here <laughs> women female directors of the world make make more westerns because we want to see some some of those stories exactly um, I think that that just about wraps us up here. Thank you so much to everybody for listening. Of course, we are very grateful to all of our listeners, and we are especially grateful to our patrons who 
support us and uh, and give us some of their monies to help things uh, going, keep things going. Uh, so thank you so much to Heather, Adriana, Cricket Table Podcast, Michael, Jacob, James, Katie, Cariata, Mason, Matthew, Michelle, Monty, Nanina, Nicole, Robert, Sharon, Steve, Tao, and Will. Uh, and of course, if you want to contribute to our Patreon, uh, that's patreon.com slash citizen dame. And we are going to have some new bonus episodes going up. We're going to be revising a few things, I think, on the Patreon uh, before long. So I'm going to have some time those. now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Because I have none, um, but we are gonna we are gonna do some bonus episodes. We're gonna do some some short little reviews and like a bunch of fun things. So watch out for those. Uh, uh, of course, if you want to uh, if you want to follow us on many different social medias, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Citizen Dame Pod. Uh, we are on Facebook.com slash Citizen Dame. You can send us an email, citizendamepod at gmail.com. Uh, we do try to pay attention to that, and you can send us questions, comments, praise, no insults. We will just insult you back. <laughs> uh, if you want to read some of our reviews and some other fun things that will continue to go up on the website, our website is citizendamepod.com. And we do have a Zazzle store, that's zazzle.com slash citizen dame pod. We've got some fun stuff up there, including masks, because everybody should be wearing your masks. Please wear masks. Let's end this whole thing. Uh, we also have a Ko-Fi. That is co-fi.com slash citizen dame. If you want to just send us a few dollars uh, without making any commitment to the, the Patreon, of course, we understand that. And of course, you can get in touch with us individually. Karen, where are you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at Karen M. Peterson. And I am on Twitter and Instagram at LH Business. Uh, so that closes us out for this week. We will talk to you later. Bye. What did you expect? Welcome, Sonny. Make yourself at home. Marry my daughter. You've got to remember that these are just simple farmers. These are people of the land. The common clay of the New West. You know. Morons. <laughs>